I think it's meet and fitting that we should allow that call to prayer, my favorite one of the day, uh, to set the stage for our discussion. Because it strikes me that part of what Thesiger is trying to do in his prose and in his photographs is capture something about the experience that is embodied by that sound and that spirituality. I think that's the kind of thing that he's looking for. It's interesting to note what he lived through, which was basically the span of the 20th century. He was born on June 3rd, 1910, uh, at the British Legation in Addis Ababa, then Abyssinia, in a mud brick building because his uh, father was a consul general there. He had an extraordinary childhood, seeing all kinds of things that two-year-olds and six-year-olds don't normally see in Africa and in India. He went to prep school to Eton, um, and then to Oxford. He then became someone who was attached to the British military operation in Africa. And you have to understand, I think, that the, the desert trips are in some sense his personal response to the horror of the mid-20th century. While World War II is coming to its close and having its aftermath, Thesiger is here in Arabia and he's looking for something. And I think the beginning of what you might have read for today captures, he, in, in the first paragraphs of the excerpt, he starts to capture what it is that he's looking for. He says, to return to the empty quarter would be to answer a challenge. To remain there for long would be to test myself to the limit. Much of it was unexplored. This is the mid late 1940s, 45, 46 to 48. It was one of the few places left where I could satisfy an urge to go where others had not been. The circumstances of my life was so, had so trained me that I was qualified to travel there. The empty quarter offered me the chance to win distinction as a traveler, but I believed that it could give me more than this, that in those empty wastes I could find that peace that comes with solitude and among the Bedou comradeship in a hostile world. And this phrase, this set of sentences interests me as somebody who's interested in cosmopolitan theory, which as I study it, is about embracing what is different, taking the sameness that exists between human beings, not as the end all and be all, but as a starting point, but then seeing the difference between human beings as an opportunity rather than a problem that you might solve. I think Thesiger does this. He says, many who venture into dangerous places have found this comradeship among members of their own race, but not him. A few, he includes himself, find it more easily among people from other lands, this very differences which separate them, binding them even more closely. I found it, he writes, among the Bedou. Without it, these journeys, which you read about, would have been a meaningless penance. So I want to ask you to think a little bit about the ways in which the text that you have read, the photographs that you've seen, um, in some sense capture this spirit of cosmopolitanism, a man from Europe, coming to Arabia to understand other people, and by understanding other people, finding some way to understand himself. That's part one of the question I'd like to ask. But there's a second part. The second part of the question is this. In doing so, is he somehow constructing Arabia? Is he romanticizing it? Is he, in fact, open to difference in the end? Those of you who have read the Penguin edition or who after this discussion might be interested in reading the full version of Arabian Sands will find that he writes two prefaces in which he comes back to this region having been away for many years he comes back in 1977 where Abu Dhabi is starting to become the Abu Dhabi that we know and it isn't the Abu Dhabi that he wants to find he's hoping that his old companions will dislike it but they see it in some sense as wonderful signs of progress for themselves they, he writes at the end of the first preface, had adjusted themselves to this new Arabian world, something I was unable to do. We parted before I went to Abu Dhabi, which I found an Arabian nightmare, the final disillusionment. That's 1977, shortly before what you were listening to. He goes back 13 years later, and in some sense, they're showing his photographs. He's a little bit more reconciled to it. But in a certain way, fundamentally for him, it is wrong to be able to cross the empty quarter by car. And I'll leave it there. Cosmopolitan, romantic, maybe a little bit of both. Cool. <clears throat> so um, I first read this book uh, in October, I think it was, when I took a trip to Liwa, and I took a trip 
to that wonderful resort that's out there, the uh, Casa Nal Saba. And uh, I had looked at the desert with my own eyes and was amazed, astonished. And then I looked at the desert with Tessinger's eyes, and I was even more amazed and astonished. I loved the book, which Cyrus, I think, has a copy of. Do you, Cyrus? But anyway, you, some of you have read this, the whole thing, right? Uh, it gives a much different picture of Tessinger, I think, than what we've just read in the shortened version of it. And, uh, and so there's some things in here that I'd like to talk about. And I think having read the whole thing also has an impact on, on my remarks. I especially love the photographs. He is a fabulous photographer. And you probably saw some of his photographs uh, earlier when there was the Fort Festival, because it was his photographs that were kind of adorning the walls of the, of the enclosure. But uh, while I kind of agree with Cyrus in terms of the romanticizing bit of it, I have to say that I was completely swept away because the prose is so gorgeous and, and the relentlessness of his journey is such that I could feel hunger with him and thirst with him, all of those kinds of uh, emotions that also were wonderful to feel in the safety of reading a novel because I, or a memoir rather, because I knew I wasn't going to die of thirst, obviously, and I wasn't going to have to kill the camel kind of thing. Um, and that, and, and uh, it, it, it's said to me, feeling those kinds of things and having those kinds of thoughts and being transported in that way, that I was reading not just a, a great story and a great memoir, but I was reading a great writer, somebody who was able to take me to that place of identification uh, that got me to a place where I, I could be in his skin as much as I could be. Uh, this is a slight parenthesis. As much as I could be as long as I could identify with being a man, uh, because one of the questions one might ask is, where are the women in this story? It's not just in the bit about the empty quarter that you've read in these several voyages, but there is kind of no sign of a female, except for female camels, which are very useful, mm. <laughs> um, from the beginning of the memoir, to, of, the, of this recounting, to the end. There, there, there are a couple of female characters, but we're in not only, uh, so if cosmopolitanism, Cyrus, excludes women, maybe we're in a cosmopolitan world. That's just something I would like to suggest. Um, I think uh, what I'd also like to say about this is that I, I felt I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the Bedou, but also like Cyrus, I'm not sure that I really learned a lot about the Bedou, I, but, I, but, but rather I learned what Tessager thought about the Bedou. And uh, now I feel as if I really need to read ethnography to know if these people that he wrote about with their e exceptional mood swings, the kind of tremendous humor they could have, but at the same time, the fierce violence, the uh, forms of vengeance that they had, the playfulness, but also this, the, this kind of ability to put up with terrible things and, and persevere, a kind of perseverance that I think is unheard of in, in, in contemporary times. Are, were these, in fact, the people that he lived with? Are these, in fact, who the Bedou were? And if they were, and maybe they were, then I ask myself, who are the Emirati people that we live with today? What, what has happened to this Bedou in their lives, right? Uh, how have they absorbed this character? And what does it mean for them to be living in this? And then I find myself thinking, I'm just like that stupid Tessinger. I would like them to be back in the desert, dying of childbirth, I suppose, if he talked about the women, right? In other words, I, uh, it made me go back and forth about this question of uh, a past that I can only grasp through my imagination that I think I would like to be in but knowing that the reality of that life was so terrible that probably the average life expectancy must have stopped around the age of 39 or so. Uh, and that a lot of the people who died first were, of course, the women and the children, whom we don't see in the novel. So th these, are things that, these are things I thought about. Um, and I guess I would stop there, except to say that one of the reasons to read the whole Arabian Sands, besides of getting a sort of a larger sweep of the whole thing, is for the last couple of chapters in which he talks about Sheikh Zayed uh, as a young man. They're wonderful chapters. And, uh, and at, at the time, he was holding down the fort, kind of literally, living there, um, having the best and the fast and the most wonderful camels, not yet being the ruler he became, but obviously ready to become that person. And, 
and certainly when when uh, when Tessinger wrote this this book, uh, he it was it was before Zayed had become the Zayed that we know of now, this great mythic figure. But you can always see him. You can already see him prefigured in the way that Tessinger writes about him. That, on the contrary, gives me hope that maybe Tessinger isn't exaggerating so much because the man that I see in his narrative sort of jives with the person that we hear about when we, read, when we think about him and when we know about him uh, in, in contemporary um, Emirati uh, culture. So I guess uh, I have one, one other thing I will say, and that is um, I think one of the things that struck me very deeply about this, and this may be because I read Samuel Beckett quite a lot, uh, and Samuel Beckett's plays, uh, where which many of which he situ situates in a kind of desert, right, where life is death and death is life, and it's all about enduring. But enduring isn't very much fun. But sometimes it's funny, right? So I, I I thought about Beckett quite a lot, and I thought about Tessinger saying, while he was in the desert, that sometimes it got so hard he didn't think he could go on. But he would ask himself, would I rather be anywhere else? And he always ended up saying. No, this is where I want to be. And I, I think somehow that distills also something about um, this weird existentialism of Beckett that can also be read as a kind of mysticism. This is what it's all about. This is all there is. And I'm going to hang on to it, because that's all I can do. So. I'll come back to you uh, something of what, uh, of what Judy was saying about the this, the feel that was existential feelings of and would I rather be anywhere else? Because that that was such an intriguing question for me. Um, one thing that I'm very interested in in literature is the sense of place and what it means for someone to be from somewhere, and how does your geography and your cultural background uh, shape your actions and your and your decisions. Uh, so that's some of the, the lens through which I was reading this, reading this narrative and trying to evaluate both the place and this interesting interaction between an, an adventurer, a European adventurer, and his Bedou supporters and, uh, and companions. And just in, in the first instance, one thing that I loved about, about reading this prose was uh, reading about the diversity of the desert. Uh, I think before you see much of it, or if only what you see um, is something like Abu Dhabi or an urban landscape, it comes as a revelation that the sand dunes are of different colors and, and that there are different kinds of sand dunes. There are stretches of gravel uh, or stretches of white sand, and then the, the red color and the brown color and the how the how the dunes look at different at different times of day. So despite what there might have been an incredible amount of monotony uh, crossing crossing these landscapes, you still get a feeling of that there is incredible uh, diversity and diversity of, of animal life as well. Um, much of which I think has gone extinct um, as, uh, with um, uh, the passage of cars and highways going going through the desert. So that was. It was interesting to uh, to uh, to see the full scale, um, and to and to see how Thessinger was able to pay attention uh, to that diversity despite the hardship as well. And, uh, and speaking to the, the the motivation of Thessinger to take this journey, and what Cyrus mentioned about desiring both the both uh, solitude and companionship, I found that very compelling, and certainly one can understand that there was an escape element trying to escape some of the uh, the horrors of the, uh, worlds, uh, the wars of the 20th century. And it's hard to imagine a situation where you would have more solitude uh, than some of the days that, uh, that he experienced, and more a sense of dependence on other people. So whether you call that companionship or not, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I was also struck by uh, how uh, Thesiger describes the great desire for the news and how this is uh, something that um, it becomes, it's a piece of information that you carry around with you and that you can offer to the people that you meet. And it's an exchange, you're, you're, you're bartering news. 
Um, and if, even if you say what you want is to stop for some camel milk, what you might really want more than camel milk is to know what's going on, um, is to know the, the news, what's happening, and the exhaustive detail in which some of his hosts wanted to know what, what was going on. And that is a, a human trait across, across time. And it's, uh, we're all here today to talk about a book. And we're in the middle of a social media culture. And uh, so thinking about the, the news in the middle of the desert was, was particularly fun. Uh, so I wonder uh, if that was something that, uh, that you thought about as well. And then the, uh, the, the final question I, I have for, for the audience is just is thinking about the, the motivation of an, of an adventurer and an explorer like this. There is a personal desire for escape and for these kinds of, uh, for this solitude and companionship, but there is also a desire to map and to make an impact, to gather information, to create a product. Um, and to be known for, for doing this, to be, no, to be known for being a great adventurer. Um, and so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't escape thinking, why, is he, why does he keep doing this, given how risky it is? It's so incredibly risky. He's putting his life and his companion's life in peril. What are bo both sets of motivations? The motivations of the explorer, which I can not, almost admire, but not quite, given how risky it is. And when he's really in trouble, how much sympathy do I have for him? Um, and on the other side, the companions, he talks about feeling quite guilty for putting uh, the, the people who, the Betty who are supporting him and coming with him at, at such risk. Um, and we don't know much about why they chose to go on this uh, adventure with him. So I, I'm interested in other people's uh, thoughts about about that as well. Um, I lived two years in isolated desert. That's why I relate to this book very much. Um, my husband, ex-husband, was transferred to Haf al Batan to build a King Khaled military city in the middle of nowhere. I was the only Arabic-speaking woman in this compound. On Friday, it was really, really lonely, nothing to do. There was no internet at that time or any kind of social media. So um, Colonel Little was the head of the compound. One day, he said, let's go and roam the desert with a campus only. In 10 minutes, we lost the camp. We lost anything around us except the horizon. It was really, really spooky feeling. You look around you and you see only sky, horizon, and sand. So I really realized um, Mr. Late Satyagar feeling, life and death is a hairline in the desert. Mm -hmm. And this is where the euphoria comes and this is where the adrenaline comes. And I really realized where spirituality comes to. Well, I wrote a little book called Ali and the Camel. It has been in the market for years and years. <laughs> Maybe my little legacy for the desert. So I really appreciate this. And hopefully, next book, I will get some of his ideas in it for children, of course. Thank you. Thank you. I was struck, um, Judy, when you were talking about uh, where the women were. Um, and I was thinking about the United States in the westward expansion, uh, the movement from the East Coast out west, um, because of course the country was empty, so we should all just go uh, live there. Um, and that if you hear those stories originally in the, the history, there were no women, it was just men. And then later they started recovering women's diaries from this westward movement. Um, and it's this sort of other history you hear. And the diaries are full of things like, went six miles today, gave birth, uh, <laughs> lost an oxen, forded a river. And, and the, the, the sort of the female version of crossing the desert or crossing the land is a, sometimes a really interesting story unto itself. And I wonder what some of the women who uh, came out at the camps and brought them water, what their story might have looked like. Um, thank you for your comment. Um, I was very taken by what Judy said about the quality of his prose. I mean, it just I've only started reading the book. Um, I'm only into the third chapter, so I haven't yet. I'm just about to arrive in the empty quarter. But even this, this, far, this only 
so far into the book, it's obvious that he has an amazing command of the language. His ability to describe scenes um, is just amazing. It's not something, it's like nothing I've ever come across before in terms of one's ability as a writer. And it's very interesting listening to the Desert Island Discs piece when um, Roy, Plum Roy Plumley asks him, has he, ha, did he ever train as a photographer? Did he have any teaching as a photographer? And he didn't. And I understand he didn't have much any training as a writer either. And it's amazing when you look at the photographs and then you and and you you read his ability to describe a scene just in a few words. The ec the economy of the language and the and the choice of words instantly takes you there. And now you see how amazingly technically good his photography is, as well as being brilliant at capturing the scenes. I just find it incredible that a man who has no training as a writer, no training as a photographer, is able to use both visually with his photographs and through his writing to be able to just take you there. It's an amazing achievement. Imagine, he probably never even got an MFA. He just wrote, right? He just did it. I think the, the economy is exactly the right word. And uh, I was thinking, Cyrus, when you were, say, when you were c citing this beginning and the fact that he clearly wanted an exceptional experience. And to a certain extent, he thought of himself as exceptional, or rather as other. But there's nowhere in the text do we get the sense of a smug, self-centered, narcissistic person. Look at what I see. Look at what I know. And, and even though he positions the Bedou in a way where he feels he can talk about them as an expert, the Bedou are like this and the Bedou are like that, it never, it never, I never really feel as if I'm seeing this kind of superiority that one might think that one would feel from a Westerner who, implanting himself in that. And I, I think it has a lot to do with how sparse he is, how careful he is in the way that he uses his prose. If, I think he's a deeply interesting character, actually. I think that there, there's a really interesting certain kind of white male European psychology which unfolds for us. Um, in the introduction to the Penguin edition, they, he talks a little bit about the fact that, that in some sense, he's just not that interested in women for reasons. And, and he's actually not, not what we would call a homosexual. He's not really sexual at all. He's looking, although he said, you know, in, in a different time and place, maybe he would have been more interested in men than, but that's not what he's about. But there is a certain kind of, of just uh, interest in what we would call now maybe a kind of homosocial world. And to me, actually, just, just so, you, so we're clear about this, I actually think that's one of the ways in which I would think of him as the limits of him as a kind of cosmopolitan thinker. Or put it another way, if cosmopolitanism is about trying to encounter difference, he's very comfortable in a certain way with cultural difference or difference of ethnicity. But clearly gender difference is a frontier beyond which, to, to which he cannot, cannot get. And I think that's just, it's a very interesting portrait of a certain kind of male mind. Yeah, it is. Because asceticism it, it, that is it's, coming it's out. It's almost as if the Beidou don't have anything to do with women either. <laughs> they well, don't, you know, and surely they have wives and lovers and daughters and, and, and a life with women. But this is not a life he's interested in. Right. Yeah. So the question is, is that true of the Beidou? I mean, it goes back to the question you were asking. Is, yeah. this, a, is this an ethnography? It doesn't really exactly feel like one. So is he seeing them in a way that, in some sense, actually is part of a stereotype rather than in, in engaging in difference. I, I'm thinking about the comments you're making about women. And this is year three for me of teaching in Banias in a school, a kindergarten that's made up mainly of two chief um, Bedouin tribes. Many of the children go on weekends with their families to the Liwa area and stay. Um, what I've come to learn about the culture, because I partner with a, an Emirati teacher every day, and um, this year my partner is actually, um, both sides of her family come from an Omani tribe. And I don't know if he did not speak of women because of anything you're saying. Um, my experience here has been that out of reverence and respect for the women and the culture, that it is not polite to speak of them or about them or ask about them. 
They have very separate lives entwined with their families, but the family unit is, is very much intact and somewhat private. And I wonder if, if, that, if the book is more out of respect of that boundary and being aware of that. And I also, in reading Arabian Sands and in reading the um, excerpts, um, came to think of um, his experience here as more like it is for, I think, all of us when we look at it. We learn more, like you said, about our own culture and about our, our own place in the world. And I think you initially come to a different culture in the tourist mentality and you see things always comparing. For instance, one of my coworkers um, said, well, in Canada, we do this. In Canada, we do this. Or, and I've heard that from others as well. You stay long enough and you assimilate in a different way. You spend time. I think it becomes less of a um, view from being the outsider to trying to understand what makes you unique in your culture and your beliefs and your values. And I, I think I saw that. And I, I especially liked reading in the book the parts where it talked about the Banias tribe. Because in Banias, um, the Elmansuris, the Almanhalis, the tribes that came across the desert at the behest of uh, Sheikh Zayed to live here amongst the um, Qasr al Hassan and then moved when they didn't maybe like the um, development that was going on and they wanted to preserve their culture and way of life, they were given the area of Banias. And I, I see in that, in working on a daily basis with them and getting to know them and going to their homes and you know, getting to know their children, that there's a real struggle, a cultural struggle going on for them. The same thing that I think went on for Thiesiger in his travels is that almost a nostalgia for what is or what was and trying to preserve that and sort of mourn the loss of anything that happens when things are changing so quickly. Yeah. Thank you. You know, Canada, it's weird. You know, Canadians, how do they do things? Um, somebody else or a response to that? I think maybe while people are thinking, Thesiger, you heard it a little bit in, the, in the, the thing that we listened to, but he has a wonderful book about the Marsh Arabs, um, which actually has preserved something that is now completely lost. That is a culture that has been, was basically eradicated by Saddam Hussein. So there's a sunny way in which, you know, by virtue of going and writing and taking photos, he, does ha he has become this kind of documentary, this place where the preservation of an entire culture uh, it, it, you can find. So I think those of you who are interested in Thessinger in Arabia might also be think, interested in, in the book on the Marsh Arabs, which is also wonderful. Uh, good evening. Thank you. I just have one comment. Um, I attended a, a lecture here last year, about a year ago. He uh, was an anthropologist. He said he had been to, uh, I can't even remember the name of the city in Saudi Arabia. He did a study there. And I think in the early 60s or 70s, and he said that at that time, women had a very strong influence in the community. Uh, he said that uh, women actually controlled the, the, the family unit. So I'm surprised that uh, people are thinking that women in you know, the Middle East don't have any, any power or any say or any you know, importance uh, in their society. Um, you know, we all live in, I guess we all live in somehow in the Middle East and we do see the, the strength of women um, in their, you know, their family units and their culture. So um, how he could write a book and just completely ignore women who are very, you know, important and strong uh, uh, influence in, in a culture is, uh, it sort of amazes me. Thank you. I'm Canadian, by the way. <laughs> I, didn't mean, I didn't mean anything by that at all. <laughs> But it is, but it is, uh, this is, this is for the, I'm from upstate New York, so almost a Canadian, right? And, uh, and what, um, what, is, what is said at one point is the people who get caught in the desert, get caught up in the desert, get caught up in what you described, right? As this nexus of life and death, so, and, and you don't quite know where you are, but there's a connection with the universe that comes from that. It's the same for people who live in the snow 
and who live on the sea. So I, I think I, I think about my childhood when there was so much snow in upstate New York, I couldn't see out my front door. Now that isn't exactly the desert, but I have sort of a sense of what that oneness felt like then when the air was cold and wet and there were huge, huge snowflakes. I also lived in the state of Wisconsin for 20 years where it was minus 40 degrees for about a month a year. Th this is hard going, right? It's not the desert, but it is a desert kind of thing. Thank you. I was um, struck the the pr thing that Cyrus read at the preface where um, Fessinger talks about, um, he says in the preface, they that many who venture into dangerous places have found this comradeship among members of their own race. And so there's that sort of image of, of being really comfortable with your own race and this you get this sense from the preface of you know there's going to be unity and and these these the bedou all understand each other and there's this connection and then later in the shorter version you hear them all saying oh well you can't trust those guys and those guys are going to kill you and don't go over there and oh my god are we going to go over here and oh those they're very bad so there's this i was wondering if anybody else sort of noticed that or had anything to say about that there's that there's Thessinger sort of talking about unity and cosmopolitanism, but then among the people he's traveling with, there doesn't seem to be quite such a similar sense of connection even across tribes. There's much more a sense of, you know, they are they and they should stay over there and we are here. And if we go there, then that's... So I wondered if anybody else noticed that or thought about that or wants to disagree with my observations. There are particular people who are allowed to be the in-betweens also. Um, so I found that, that interesting, this idea of having a, uh, a safe person or a custodian or um, someone who is uh, certain, certain tribes or certain people who are allowed to be the connectors or the ambassadors of, of some kind. So that, and I, I wondered how much that, um, how that, those alliances change over time, whether it was always the same people who were allowed to be the connectors or whether it shifted um, politically. Actually, Thesiger was very smart. He realized how the Bedou communicate with the nature and with each other. He noticed, for instance, the camel dropping. If they see it, they know which, uh, which camel belongs to which tribe from their, uh, the nature or the texture of their dropping and even the, the shape of the hoofs. And they know if it's enemies or there was a raid before, just by relating and tracing a little signal which never occurs to uh, maybe Westerners to think of it as significant. I thought that was very, very important things to know how, how desert people communicated with their movement, with their tribes, with the knowing that this, these camels belong to other tribe, not to them or how many hours or days ago they passed by, and their direction, and which direction they're coming from. Bedu could tell. It's amazing uh, notice, I thought. Thank you. Uh, your comment reminds me of the gentleman in the back who talked about different perspectives, right? Some people see one thing and they can read it, they can read the landscape a certain way, and other people read it a different way. Um, anybody else? But maybe, maybe the... The connection with the photography, this, the, the great photographer that he, that he was, is also co somehow connected to the fact that he learned how to look, he learned how to see when he was with the Bidu. Um, because there's, there's something kind of uncanny about being such a great photographer and a great writer at the same time. Mm -hmm. And maybe it has to do with the precision of the looking, how, how when, when you don't have to be, when, when you don't have to see signs everywhere, because your life doesn't depend on those signs. You don't see them. But when your life depends on being able to see, you learn how to see. Thank you very much for giving me the chance also. And really, I, you know, if I grow up as a, as a Badu lady, and if I get the chance to be educated this much, I'll, be, I'll try my best to be away from that not the opposite to be deep on that, that I really appreciate the motivation that make him attracted and make him continue with that. So I just want to ask your idea. What, make, what gives him this will and this motivation to continue, to, to, to struggle, to, to really suffer, to accept to suffer this much and to stay? If I wear 
if I was a lady there, as a lady, I would try myself, if I get the education, to escape from all this stuff uh, around me. So what make him really, I appreciate it. I appreciate it without any thing I appreciate it. I deeply appreciate it. So I just want your opinion. What, what gives him the motivation to struggle and to, to continue till the end? That's a really good question. I, I, I think that's one of the reasons why we marvel at this novel because we keep on asking that question. It's what Cyrus said, that he's a really complex fellow, right? And we can gloss on that. We can all pretend to know what makes, what makes, what motivates him, what makes him the way he is. And I could discourse on it in a pseudo-scientific way as though I were a psychoanalyst and kind of got it. I'm not sure I get it. And I think that's one of the, the real compelling things about this, is trying to figure out what is it that makes him do this? He nearly starves to death. He never has enough to eat. He's always hungry. And yet he says, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. So, so maybe it is, you know, getting back what you said, the sense that you're, you're alive every second when you're on that edge. I think there are a, there's a couple of kinds of things that are going on. I'll, I'll toss out a couple of them. One of them, I think, is sort of cultural, right? He's a Brit in the middle of the 20th century arguably a representative, and part of a colonial administration, arguably a representative of the greatest empire ever created in the history of humankind, bigger than the Roman Empire, you know, a, a scion of the Enlightenment. And look what the Enlightenment created, the European Enlightenment, two world wars, incredible horror. There's a certain way in which you could read Kessiger along with certain kinds of modernist writers who are looking back to other places. Many people look to Africa and created primitive art, look for primitivism, right? To look to simpler ways, alternative ways, non-Western ways, because the West has mucked it up. And that might be one of the things, you might say, that it's his motivation, looking for another way of being in the world that isn't tainted by what uh, Western enlightenment has created. A personal thing might be to think a little bit about his background, the fact of not fitting in, some of the things I mentioned about what, what may or may not have interested him in other people, the fact that he didn't fit in in the school, that he was constantly trying to prove himself. I mean, he became a boxing champion when he was in college. So there's a certain kind of masculinity that he's looking for. Well, who could possibly be more masculine than these Bedou who prove themselves every day against the desert just to stay alive? So I think that there's a couple of things, at least, that are going on there that give him, in some combination, the will to do this. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I was very struck by what you just said about him going to the desert and finding the same thing, right? Vengeance and combat and so on. Obviously, he didn't see it in the same way. So he's framed it in an entirely different way. It, he, he hasn't left one thing to find the same thing. He's left, in his mind, the way he gives it to us, he's left one thing to find or, something entirely different. Or maybe it's different. honorable combat, right? I mean, mano a mano, you can, uh, you know, or guns where you can at least yeah. see who you're killing as opposed to the kinds of you know, mustard gas in the World War I and God knows what else in World War II, right? It's a, almost like thinking you can go back to Troy and, and be part of that kind of yeah. warrior culture. I think, I think we're, we're over-analyzing things and we're over-complicating we do things. Uh, he, he was a simple person, and that's why he went back to the desert over and over again. It, it wasn't because of, of to, to find anything, but to find himself. And that's part of being an adventurer. You do that because you're trying to find yourself. I mean, the, the empty quarter was already discovered before that. And he never actually wanted to write a book. He was actually proposed to write a book. Mm -hmm. So he never did it to write a book, and he never did it to actually achieve anything, but do it for, for the spirit of, of the adventure. And he did that twice because he loves it so much. I mean, I've, I've done many things, and I love going to the desert. And you, you, can, you can tell the stories, you can try to explain it, but unless you go and you feel it and try to you know, immerse yourself in it yourself, you will never understand it. So we can sit here and talk about all you know, his adventures. But unless you really go and stay, sorry, five, six, seven, eight days in the desert, you really won't understand what it is to be out there. Uh, because it, it and, and he does write really well. I mean, when you read when you read his book, and when he's saying, "I am hungry and I'm I'm thirsty," I get hungry and thirsty, and I want to go and you know have a have a gla glass of water. Uh, he does write really well. But the thing is, what he's trying to get out of the book is the simplicity of the way that they live. It's, it's not the, the 
over complication. And that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to get out of this sort of European culture and go back to that sort of... I would submit that it's a very complex guy who looks for simplicity in that particular way. And, and, and he, that's, what, that's what he did. He just wanted simplicity. And that's why I go camping. I mean, we, we spent two days in the empty quarter on our last national day, and it was fantastic. It's just, you, you just go there and you have nothing to think of but the vast emptiness of the empty quarter, which is, which is amazing. And I think that's what he's trying to translate through his book. Every kind of traveler uh, is both process and destination, right? It's, it's, about getting so, it's about going somewhere and it's about the process of, of getting there. Um, and so I, I think actually you can both, uh, it's important to him both to experience the, the desert and the solitude and, uh, and the life there and the, um, the sort of multi-party work that's needed uh, to, to be there. But um, it did, does seem to me that it was very important for him to have done it to have accomplished it, to have crossed the empty quarter, and not just once, but twice. If he, had, if he had been able to, if he had pen and paper and was in the middle of the empty quarter, knew he was going to die without crossing it, I think he would have been very unhappy <laughs> that there was you know, something very important about um, not only the process, but um, identifying the destination and the goal and, and accomplishing it. We might say that he's a simple man, right? And he has, a, and he likes this kind of simplicity, and all of that might be true. I don't, but it seems to me extraordinary that he got to go to the desert because he was doing a survey about locusts. He does tell us he's a Christian. Now we do know about the plagues, right? So it does. It, there, there seem to be a lot of elements that he builds in here very subtly, that nevertheless give this whole thing a different valence than just a travel story. That it, there is something of the metaphysical that enters into this. So that I, I think the simplicity has something to do, I, not, maybe not so different from what you said. There's a kind of communion that happens, right? Oh. I just wanted to answer your, your question about why would he leave all this behind, but we have examples elsewhere in the world of monks who just you know retire to a cave and decide that they want to leave everything behind and leave, live in nature. Uh, and we have this all over the world. Uh, even nowadays, I mean, people do their yoga retreats and want to go uh, to a center in the middle of India and not eat much and meditate all day. So, I mean, we have examples nowadays even for that. Uh, regarding your, question, your um, comment about, you know, what makes a good chief or ruler, uh, and uh, Sheikh Zayed being such a great ruler already at, at that time. I mean, he wasn't ruling the whole emirate. He was, he was ruling the eastern, uh, the eastern region. He was the, the ruler's representative there. And he was a peacemaker because before he got, uh, he got that position, there were actually a lot of tribal raids in that area. And his job for 10 years when he first got there was to reestablish peace. And the way he did that was being somebody who actually bore news and collected news, um, but also was a, a very um, charismatic person. And uh, the, the way to bring tribes together is actually being able to barter with things that you have, either through um, like possessions, like palm, palm dates, for example, in Alain. I mean, this is where, this is where he was or through um, tribal alliances through marriage, actually. This is another way of, of doing it. Um, so this is what, how he got, and retaining some of the, actually the, 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 the trick he used was to retain some of the raiders, so he turned the raiders into his companions and brought yeah. them in that way. Um, so that was a passport for, for, and being endorsed by Sheikh Zayed at the time was a passport for uh, Thesiger to, to, to go around that area. Yeah. On another note, if you'd like to see some of these photos, um, they're actually displayed at Jahli Fort in Alain. Uh, the Pitt Rivers uh, gave digital copies of their photographs to uh, Abu Dhabi Tourism and Culture Authority, and they've uh, restored the fort and adapted it into a museum, which in one of the wings has a whole display of all these photographs and video clippage 
from uh, interviews with his companions, actually, and some of the objects that he used during his trip. So. In, inter interviews you. in Arabic with his companions, then? Oh, that's great. And are, are they translated for those of us who don't speak Arabic? Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, this is a lame question because I want to ask a question of uh, Cyrus, actually, because I didn't get to read the book or reread it before today. So I'm, I'm sort of an imposter here, not having read it. Because I, I read it 31 years ago, so I, I was told it was okay to come. As a student, actually, I was a second year student at university. And I read it, it's one of those books where I remember where I read it and the circumstances, and I read it all in one go. I've been camping on the, and the, what's it called, the French Riviera on the sands. And, but it wasn't working out because all the police wouldn't let you camp. You weren't allowed to, actually. So we had to just take the train back to Paris, and on the train back to Paris, I read this book and spoke a bit of Arabic with a Moroccan and didn't really realize I had a long way to go. But in any case, I read this book and I was wondering about, I'm going to ask you a question, but I just might as well give, give some sense of the feelings I was left with or what I remember of, the, of that reading 31 years ago, because I, 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 I felt I was wondering about the authenticity of the man. Um, I was very really struck by the two young men that he, he, devote, he, he um, dedicates the book to Bin Gubaysha and Bin Kab Kabisha and Gubaysha, yeah? They, they struck me as very wolf-like and uh, supine and, and mysterious and, and, and totally at home in the desert. And I found him uh, rather ungainly, you know, this very tall character who seemed out of place. And, and uh, I wondered for years after that what, whether, how authentic he was as a writer of... of of, of Arab culture, of this part of Arab culture, because, um, and it's only really coming back to the Emirates and seeing those, these, those photos in the Jahari Fort that I realize he is respected enormously in the Emirates, I, I think. So they, that for me answered that question I posed way back, you know, he, they saw him as authentic, Zayed saw him as authentic, a, a really interesting character, so that persuaded me that actually I'd probably misjudged him. And I, I you know, when you, you talked about his, the homoeroticism or the homosocial uh, social nature of that, uh, you know, of that troop of people crossing the desert. I, I, I assume, you know, he was an Etonian and he would have, if he'd stayed in England, he would have been a bachelor and we, and the bachelor meant something different in those days. So it was, it was better for him to be an adventurer than to stay in London and be a bachelor. So he was really out of place, a man out of place in the sense that Said uses, uses the word. So those, those are my memories. And uh, my question to you is, is what do the students that you're reading with, uh, th reading the book with, think of the book? And what is their... Their thing? first impulse to say, oh, no, I understand something about this place. I mean, and I think they do understand something. But what it is they understand about this place then becomes a little bit more complicated. And finally, I think some of the, the most interesting discussions we've had have turned exactly on that question of what constitutes authenticity. What is the authentic culture of the UAE? In a certain way, Thesiger is now a part of the authentic culture. He, he does document many things. It is hard really to separate what is factual from what is colored over with his particular perspective. And yet, he's been embraced as, in some sense, the official bearer of the cultural heritage of a part of the UAE, right? He, in the Qasr al Hassan festival, it's his photos that are all over the place. And in fact, he has, the, the camera does document certain things. The prose does document certain things, but as with anything, you know, I'm, I'm often put in mind of Washington Irving's History of New York, which was in some sense written not only to be a history, but a mock history, and to create a mythology at the same time as it was writing history, so much so that historians of New York still can't figure out exactly what he made up and what is local knowledge that was otherwise a preferred. So I think to, to, for us, it becomes very interesting to think about whether the question of authenticity is in fact the right question to be asking. This is in some sense a document about the past. It is our only um, access to that past. In a way, as a result, it is always simultaneously going to be authentic and inauthentic. And I think that's where the conversations have started to start to go as we think about it more from the aha to aha. Uh -huh is the, the general drift of our conversations in class. No, I was just, the, the authenticity was a, that I asked myself about was not about Ibn Gubaysha and, and his, they, all, they were totally authentic oh, to yeah. me. But it was about him, you know. 
what's the point of going into the empty quarter, you know? The word empty's in there. It's like the empty thing to do. What's the point? But so, you know. There might but, but the, that seems to be the abiding question tonight. But Why? I don't, don't you think the point, the point is that this empty quarter is not empty at all? That what he really demonstrates is there's no emptiness there, in fact? That it's full of life? But it's full of the life he wants it to be full of when he describes it and what he's fearful of and what comes to pass is, is that it becomes full of something else, oil derricks primarily, right? Okay, it doesn't matter if we stay two days in the desert or three days or two years. Eventually, we can all go back. And, that, and I think maybe that's the idea of authenticity. He, he's out there, he's sucking the marrow out as the road did. But he eventually, he knows that he can, through the starvation, through the hardship, he will be able to go back and bring his photographs and write a book. But there's actually something, it's actually true and not true about Tessiture because if you remember the last chapter in the long, which I urge everybody to read, is called The Closing Door. And it's deeply heartbreaking in a certain way. He realizes that because of who he is, he does have to go back. As close as he felt to the Bedou, he isn't one of them, and he can't be one of them. And so finally, in the end, he's in the paradoxical uh, situation of feeling that he's in exile, not because he's staying in Arabia, but because he has to, he has to leave it. The last things he says, the last sentences are, I was glad when Kodrai took me to the aerodrome at Sharjah. As the plane climbed over the town and swung about, out above the sea, I knew how it felt to go into exile, and that's the end of it. And he ends with that moment of exile, even though the preface tells us about coming back in 1977. So it's a very complicated dynamic that he's been part of. And in a certain way, he's made himself somebody who's at home nowhere. Yeah. But he, he, and he, he, takes, he takes responsibility for, and then he doesn't take responsibility for, the fact that he puts all of his companion's life in danger constantly. Because here he is, this Christian, right, who's not supposed to be in a lot of the parts of the desert where he is. And if, if people knew, if other tribes, uh, tribes who didn't like the tribes he was, the, the Rashida that he's traveling with, knew that they were traveling with a Christian, they'd all be dead. So and he, he takes stock of that and he says, he, now I realize the danger I put them in, but then he goes on. So that, that, that's a that's but they, they part know of the complexity. Too. Well, they, they even know, give yeah. him his name, right? They dress him up so he's not, he, he looks, and he becomes Mubarak al London. So they, they know what they're doing, I think. Um, I'd just like to pick up on a uh, comment a couple of questions ago about his, you know, whether he's authentic. Um, and it sort of takes it one step further. Do we actually like him as a human being when we read his work? Do we, do we think, would you like to talk to him? Would you have enjoyed meeting him? Would he have been a nice guy? Um, and we also talk about the comparison of the age in which he lived, what he'd been brought up with, and then translate that into modern society. There's a very revealing moment very early on in the um, preface of the Penguin edition that Rory Stewart writes, when he says he was attending a lecture at Oxford that Thesiger Thes Thes was, was a guest speaker at. And he's asked, how did he, what did the Arabian tribesmen look like, or how did he feel when he was sitting there with his enemy's testicles hanging around his neck. And Thesiger goes, well, I, f I imagine he, he, he felt like he must, might have felt when he was awarded his house colors, which is a very Etonian expression. And the young students were absolutely horrified. They thought, my God, who is this man? What, 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 what are we talking to here? And he knew no different. That is what he was brought up. That is how he saw things. Um, I thought that was a very revealing moment in the, in the preface. But I guess I go back to, you know, what do we think he was like as a person? Do we like him for what he's done? Do we like him for the way he writes English? Do we like him for the way he describes his experience? I'm very taken by the gentleman over there who said he didn't want to be a writer. He didn't do this in order to gain fame. He did it simply because he enjoyed doing it. And what's wrong with that? Anybody want to speak to that? Well, the mic's coming around. I don't like him, but I find him fascinating. Oh, I like him a lot. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think you have to like him. You don't have to like anybody. If he's interesting, read it. 
what I wondered when I read it was, why, knowing Arabic as he did, didn't he pretend to be a Muslim? It would have saved the day for his uh, companions. I certainly would have done that. Didn't he say he didn't know the prayers? Like he, he was, or he, he wasn't quite, uh, even though he's fluent in Arabic, yeah. he wasn't quite conversant in all of the, and truly all of what he would need to do. So he did pretend to be a Syri Syrian, Syrian who was lax, <laughs> sort of a, a lax, lax Syrian Muslim. My final uh, comments. I think uh, Sezgar was a very, very brave man because to think of being assassinated and robbed, it, it can come any time with the desert culture, we all know. But he took the courage. I think this was kept his adrenaline high all the, all the way. Maybe he did not express it. Uh, and, and he definitely is a hero who can communicate without, with little Arabic or none. I mean, this is the peak of the venture. You are alone, you are from different religion, you are rich, you have money, and he still was able to establish trust in himself and trust with the Bedouin around him. And that was the, probably the most heroic things he made. Um, I think then I am going to say thank you to our uh, conversation starters. Um, and thank you to all of you for uh, coming and joining us.